This afternoon we have with us Marty Finsterbush from Value USA and Margaret, Dr. Margaret Patterson who has been working on a very important research project with Value USA. Um, Marty and Margaret, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourselves, and um, let us know what you're you're doing what your work is and uh, a little bit about your background. As you said, my name is Marty Finchbush. Um, I was a student in the education program. Um, over the years, I worked in local programs, um, state levels, f through the student voice in that capacity, and now I'm the executive director of Value, so I run the day-to-day -day operation of Value USA, which we'll be talking more about later on. Thanks, Marty. Uh, my name's Margaret Patterson. I am founding partner and senior researcher with Research Allies for Lifelong Learning. We are based in the DC metro area, um, and we have a connection with Virginia in that we're, we're actually in Vienna, Virginia, and Blacksburg, Virginia as well. And um, we've been partnering with Marty in Value USA since 2014, so about five years. I think the CAPE studies where you have actually interviewed students about, uh, students and non-students about their involvement with um, adult education programs, barriers that they might have had, and for those who have never taken that step to sign up or enroll in adult education to find out what some of those reasons are and some of the barriers that those folks have had that um, have not uh, enabled them to sign up and participate in adult education. It's something that I think we've long needed in adult education, that kind of research and quantifying um, some of the issues that we've all known. We've known them an anecdotally, but we've never actually quantified um, some of these issues and concerns that our students have. And I think the opportunity to learn from them um, in this way is, is really important. I think that's one of the things that we know Value USA has brought to adult education and literacy is the student voice. And of course, that's part of what Value stands for, is uh, uh, voices of students. Um, can you tell us about the mission of Value USA and a little bit about the history and projects that you're working yes. on? Yes, um, Value's mission is improving adult-based education through the student's voice and student's involvement. Um, value came about because adult learners started to get more involved in our field, but we didn't really communicate, we didn't work together, and so when we looked at the field, we said, hey, we need our voice, and we need to be part of this, because you're not gonna solve adult education problems in the United States without us. Um, and so value started to develop, and so when research came around, we are like, there is very little research for adult education, but specifically from the student's viewpoint. And so that's why Value supports um, this research because it's one of the unique research that actually talks to us, the students. And so Value mission really is to improve adult basic education program through the adult learner involvement and leadership. And there's a lot of things we'll do, which we can talk about a little bit later, what Value does. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the main thrust of it is to prove the adult ed. Maybe you could speak to the leadership programs that you have uh, for adult learners so that they can become more involved and become advocates for adult ed and for other students in adult ed. Sure. So right now, one of the things that Valley has developed is a leadership training program. It's not just for the adult learners. What we've learned is even if adult learner is a leader and wants to get more involved, they can't if their program doesn't believe in student involvement or even know how to do it. A lot of people in our field, administrators are not, were tutors or teachers, whatever, but they're not community builders, they're not the skill builders, they're teaching academics. And so one of the things Value has developed is a two-day, eight-day training where we take administrators, we take staff, and we take adult learners from that program where we bring them together and we teach them critical thinking skills, organizing skills, but it's really about program improvement. And we also have research, if you go to our website, okay. proves that this research, this project, will improve your program. Um, and so that's one of the biggest things we're doing. And we're trying to now create the train the training manual so we can actually market it across the United States instead of me as the director running around doing these trainings and programs. Programs will be able to do their own evaluation, improving their own programs um, in the near future. We also have our own national conference which we call the Leadership Institute. We do it every other year. 
Uh, we just had one in this past June in Orlando. Um, every four years, we're in Washington, D.C. And what we do is then we actually go meet with senators and House of Representatives, the adult learners, and we they get to meet us directly. So it's not other people saying, well, my students will be benefit from this. We were able to speak for ourselves and give our viewpoint on what is going on in adult education. It's totally different. And when the politicians hear that it's us, the adult learners on there, they come. They actually come. So they're two of the biggest things that we do. But basically what we are is a resource center. So what I mean that it is if you're an adult learning leader and you want to get more involved, how do you do it? Who do you talk to? And so value is that collecting rod. So if you're a director and you want to get students more active in your program, how do you do it? It's constantly reinventing the wheel. If you call value, we can help you and say, well, what are you planning? Well, you know what? That worked here. Don't do that because this is why. Try this. And so we are the only group collecting student involvement in how do you do it in the United States and helping programs to do that. How many uh, members do you have? Well, it varies because a membership could be just one adult learner. Or, for example, Oasis is a statewide student mm -hmm. organization in Delaware, which you have lots of members. Well, that's one membership. Mm -hmm. Florida Coalition is a member of Value. That's one membership, but it gives us access to all the programs in there. So we're a vast network, not necessarily high numbers. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it certainly so, does, so because they reach hundreds, if not thousands, right. of students. So if we do e-blast, it goes out about over 2,000 people get it and programs mm -hmm. get it across the United States. But they're not necessarily all members, but our network ability is clear across the United mm -hmm. States at all levels. So we're operating on a national level but we could be asked by a local program to help us, or we could be asked by a state level to, hey, can you help us think this out? So value is actually helping a lot of national initiatives that are going on right now, um, like the X Prize values on the advisory board for that. We have, oh my God, um, my brain is burning out long days. Um, um, smart, um, help me out with um, Mammy next week. Um, oh, the Career Pathways, Career Pathways mm -hmm. Festival. So Value's been behind the scenes talking with them and helping them also mm -hmm. behind. So we do a lot of things that people don't see. We're behind the scenes. The other organizations come to and talk to Value and we help them out. But we're not, most people don't know where we mm -hmm. exist. And so you've, um a value has been an organization for a little over 20 years now? Yes, yeah, so we got our 501c3 in March of 2020. There was another little organization right before value um, of adult learners, but that's how we learned how to run our own organization. Like we didn't, it didn't succeed, but it taught us. But actually the federal government created Value USA. Most uh -huh. people do not know that, that NIFL on the National Institute for Literacy they looked at their field of adult ed and said, what is missing in adult ed? And they realized what was missing was the adult learner voice. So the federal government gave a $25,000 grant to create a national student organization. And what came out of that was value. And so very few people don't realize that the federal government created it this organization. But it is a nonprofit. Oh yeah, we're a 501c. They C3. gave seed money, they have a first meeting, mm -hmm. and so we bought 50 adult learners from around the United States to a place called Highlander. I don't know if you ever heard of Highlander in the mountains of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King went there, Rosa Parks went there two days or two weeks before she gave, refused to give up her seat on the bus. Mm -hmm. um, so you had 50 adult learners sitting in rocking chairs in a circle creating Value USA. Oh. Um, so that's where we started um, with them grassroots. And um, so we have amazing history mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, we don't that's share enough I'd never heard that before. That's yeah. a wonderful yeah, story. So. Uh, do you have any uh, film or video from that first I don't meeting? have film or videos. I'm sure there's pictures out there. We try mm -hmm. to collect some of that stuff. Um, so I haven't been good at that, yeah. <laughs> but well, we have amazing um, history. If you ever get the Highlander, mm -hmm. the students got together and we donated a rocking chair. And on that oh. rocking chair is a plaque with our name on it oh. since we started there. So if you ever get to Highlander, mm -hmm. um, there's a rocking chair with our plaque on it. It's wonderful. That's, that's a very exciting story because yeah. Highlander has really been an organization and kind of an idea that has informed Southern um, 
uh, public education for adults for many years. So that's, it's a wonderful thing that uh, Value had that opportunity to, to be born there, basically. Yep, we were. So that's, that's wonderful. Well, I know there are many other things that you're involved in, but we particularly want to hear about the CAPE study today. And uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about um, why you decided to, to um, get funding for that study and uh, what the purpose of it is. Well, I'll share a little bit of that and then I'll turn it over to Margaret because she can give her perspective on why. But for value point was, again, I mentioned earlier, is that there is very little research for adult ed. We don't have a, a national research database organization. We don't have collecting. So, and out of the federal government, they always say, well, where's your research? Where's your research? And so I've always wanted to research student involvement because we know it works. We can prove it, but we don't have research. And so when an opportunity came out meeting with Margaret, we would like to be able to research from the student perspective. What does the students think? What, because I think that's what we should be generating the way our fields should operate. So when a grant chance to come to write a grant to Dollar General to do this, um, we jumped on it because we've always been wanting research from the student per perspective. Um, and so the field just needs research. We don't have research proving what we're doing and specifically the students. And so it felt like, a, not a marriage, but it felt like <laughs> this needs to, to, it, it needs to be done. Um, and so when Margaret came up with the suggestions and we're like, we're all for this, we wanna do this. Now, she may have a different view on that. <laughs> so I'll turn the mic over to her to see what she has to say on that. Thanks, Marty. Um, yeah, so how did this come about and why? So approximately 10 years ago, I was sitting in my office one evening at GED testing service, and I was just looking at some data on the target population and who we were serving. And I kept seeing percentages like, oh, in this state it's 4%, in that state it's 5% or 2%. I'm like, what, really? That's all we're serving? And I said, that can't be right. And so I started looking in census data and other federal sources to try to get a handle on what was going on. And I realized, yeah, that was right, that those percentage, those small percentages were definitely accurate. And so if we put together all the funded adult education programs that are serving adults, the literacy programs, um, you know, pretty much everything that's out there, we might be touching maybe 10% of, of who we should be. And so um, I had the opportunity um, later on, much later on, the paper came out in 2018, to, uh, to look at PIOC data, which is a large scale uh, data set, and look at the US data and figure out that, you know, we are not serving 90% of the adults that we could be serving. And so I call that paper the forgotten 90% because I, I really feel that those people um, have not been researched for many, many years, decades, um, if you will. There was a little activity back in the 1980s, but as Marty just said, there's very little research in adult education anyway and virtually nothing in this area. And so um, we determined that that was something that we should take a look at. What's going on with this 90%? What do we need to learn? Um, I was particularly interested in the barriers and the reasons that they gave um, for not participating, what was holding them back. Um, but beyond that, uh, we wanted to get at what I would call the root causes. And so we used a technique in our interviews um, when we went out and talked with these adults to find out, you know, they would say, well, I have this reason. And then I would say, well, tell me about that. Why is it that way? And then they would explain it. And then I would say, all right, well, why is it that way? And just kind of peel back the layers until you get to the ultimate cause behind it. Um, the catch is we collected more than 1,900 excerpts <laughs> of data, of reasons that people gave, and so we managed to write three reports. 
uh, from that, really great stuff, but um, there's so much more to, to tap in that we would like to. The, the other piece about this that I think is really, really important is we didn't just find the barriers. Many people have found barriers. We know barriers like transportation and childcare, people feeling stigmatized, things like that. We've known about those for years. But in, additioning, in addition to getting to the root causes, we also ask those adults to identify for us uh, what do you think the solutions are? So most of these people were um, middle-aged, unemployed, earning less than $18,000 a year. They're not people with million-dollar solutions. They're people that come up with solutions that may cost $100 or $1,000 or nothing at all. We found a number of low-cost solutions that they recommended, and I think that's really a strength of, of what came out of this. Um, and the last thing I want to mention that we found in doing the research is um, we asked them, we gave them surveys before the interviews, and we asked them, how are you using technology? Because we knew that that was an important piece of maybe how we could reach more people to move the needle on that 90%. Um, we asked them how they value education. What, is it important to them? Is it something they want? And then we asked them how they prefer to learn because we thought that would give us good insights into reaching them. And it's, it's not just about um, reaching them and getting them in, it's keeping them there so that they finish the program and meet their educational goals. You had mentioned the uh, PIOC study and uh, perhaps you could tell our listeners a little bit about that, just a very short definition of what, that what it is and what it includes because not all of us are aware of that. Sure. Um, so as I said, we looked at the U.S. data. Um, it's a multinational data set. It was commissioned by OECD, um, which is a, an organization based in Belgium that captures uh, world economic indicators. And every 10 years or so, they decide to do a look internationally um, to see what's happening in terms of workforce participation and adult education. Um, and it's, it deals primarily with adults age 16 to 65, so those who are working age. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, Barney, and we'll go back to you. Um, when we in adult education have student-centered programming as one of our stated kind of core principles of the work that we do, um, why has it been so hard for most of us to actually be student-centered in our work? Funding. <laughs> funding, 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 and perspective. Um, so we have a lot of requirements on administrators, and a lot of times student-centered um, it's different thinking and it's different requirements. And so I, I find it's a mindset to make it more happen. And it's the little things inviting adult learners into your program to move from not just students centered, here's your students sitting in a classroom. Mm -hmm. It's students as the intake, students doing some of the tutor training. It's adult learners now moving on, helping, being coming on your board. It's adult learners, so it's, it's a center is not just sitting in the classroom. Student center is your whole entire, everything, let's put it this way, everything your program is doing, there's no reason why a former or a present adult learner could not do that job. And so it is changing a mindset. If you truly want student centered, it's, you need to change that mindset. And so there's the problem. If you're only looking at, well, student center in, teaching, reading, and writing, but nothing else, it's not going to happen in that program. And that's why it hasn't happened in the field, because it is, you need to change the way you're thinking. You need to look at the adult learners in your program, getting ready to leave your program, as a vast asset to improve your program and to change it that's why. And so that's why our field has been struggling when they keep on saying student center. Student center what? Just in teaching, reading, and writing? Or what about all the other critical thinking skills, organizing skills, and diversity? And that's, I think, the catch for our field. They haven't gone beyond that. So um, 
hopefully the CAPE study will help us to have, help us in as adult educators to change our perspectives. And I think many of us have over the years in small ways for community-based organizations, maybe having a student or two on our boards or um, on a program committee or something like that. Um, but you're really talking about reorganizing um, adult education and literacy programs so that students are involved in every part of the operation and, and the management. So of it. is our field only here to teach reading and writing in English? Or is it to give the people the basic skills that they need to survive and, and flourish, flourish, I can't say that word. F flourish? Flourish uh -huh. in our society. And so we're only about saying if we just give someone a reading skill, we just teach them English, their, their life will be better. It's more than that. It's the whole person, it's community. So who's teaching the community? How do you operate? So you're teaching structures by inviting the adult learners into our programs to be part of the program. The program becomes part of the community and the community becomes part of the program. But look at all the skill setting that you're teaching, which is transferable to the workforce. So you're inviting adult learners in to help different pieces of your program. It will enrich your program. The students that come in will see other donors, but they're getting critical skills that will make them adjust to our society more, make them adjust to their workplace more, because who's teaching that? You're waiting till we get the reading levels up to whatever level, and then all minds are gonna have all the social skills and all the communication skills and how to work with others. Mm. And so really, it behooves our field to think globally in education. It's not just mm -hmm. reading and writing. It's the whole nine yards. And with workplace literacy more becoming an ifer and adult ed, what do you need? You need to be able to critical think. You need to be able to work with other people. You need to be able to work on your thing. So why aren't we teaching that while we're teaching reading and writing? Why is it just reading and writing first? And then we'll get to these other things that the person needs mm -hmm. to survive in our society. Why is it not blended together? At the same time, the programs realize that the students is that resource that will help you do more things in your program. Mm -hmm. And so it mm -hmm. is all, all together. So it really does, you really are advocating for, um, probably for most of us in adult ed, those would be sweeping changes. So how would you um, advise programs um, to use these results to advocate for improvement in their programs and also for additional well, funding for that you For example, for this research, that's more of the intake. Why are people not coming into your programs? Um, before, if someone came into a program and they dropped out before the first 12 hours or whatever, well, they weren't interested, they weren't ready to learn. Guess what? The truth is programs are being evaluated by the adult learners and saying, this is not gonna work for me and that's why they're leaving. It's not that they're not interested. The program didn't fit their needs and whatever. So wouldn't it behoove the field to do this kind of research and ask the adult learners, well, why aren't you coming in? What's things so we can then eliminate some of the barriers to keeping them from staying? Um, you know, just giving adult learner a survey of your program and say, here's a survey, fill out the teacher's good. The students are not going to tell you verbally because there's all the power structure, class structure, all the other structure. But if you train a couple of adult learners in your program to do evaluation or collect data, you will find out really what the students think about your program and what it really needs to prove to meet the needs of the clients. Isn't that what we're supposed to be here, to meet the needs of the students, not the students filling seats to meet the needs of the programs? Right. So, it, so it, it's really this research and other is flipping their turn about if the programs are for adult learners, shouldn't we be talking mm -hmm. to them? So how would you suggest, and, and Margaret, you can chime in on this too, how would you suggest that adult educator, um, adult education programs, program managers and teachers, um, board members and community-based organizations and others who would be involved in uh, overseeing and directing programs, um, not only use the CAPE study, because I think that's a good beginning, but also use the resource that you know, are the students that you've been describing to inform their um, program improvement plans, their general planning, and also their advocacy. 
Oh, I'll let Margaret go first before <laughs> I keep on going. Because yes, there's ways of doing that. So I think the power behind the CAPE study is, is really the solutions that are offered. And if programs can take a deep look at that, we have three reports that are available on Value USA's website and on researchallies.org website as well. If people take a look at those, um, in Virginia, they've been doing uh, study circles for the last uh, six months or so, um, looking specifically a very deep dive on um, on the CAPE findings and what does that mean for recruitment, what does that mean for retention. Because you can get somebody in the door, but as Marty said, if they don't stay, you know, they're evaluating something and, and that's something, maybe something that the program isn't even aware of. So taking the time to to look at the findings and to really say, all right, how does this apply to our program? How can we take what these adults are saying they need and make sure it gets in our program and that all of our messaging gives them that sense that, yeah, if I go there, I'll get what I need. I won't have to walk. And that's the power, but the, the key is going to be getting that into practice, having, having programs and even states make the commitment um, to do that. We did the research in Virginia, it was one of our states, but we also went to Kansas and Florida and Louisiana and Ohio. So it's not just one state, I think the results speak to what's happening in, in many of the states in the USA. And so to the extent that, that state directors and program directors can look at those results, I think it will give them a lot of powerful insights to make a change. The CAPE is just the beginning. We need a lot more of this researcher. We need to find more funders and to do more of this. Because don't forget, our field have been doing the work for years, but it's, again, to solve this, we need to bring in the player, and the player is the adult learner. We need to get what they see in their view and create the programs that way. So um, this research is just the beginning, in my mind, um, that we need to do. I'm hoping that other funders and other groups will look at this and say, wow, just look at the small, we should be doing a bigger thing on this, or more research on it, because it will really then drive the way it goes, because everything you have out of Washington, D.C. is where's your research? Hmm. Um, and so I'm hoping this is just the beginning, because um, that will drive the way the adult ed should be moving in the future. Well, I know that uh, you've already had several reports that have been out, and they're on the website, as you mentioned. Um, what further reports will be released and uh, when do you expect that? So right now, this summer, um, I managed to scrape together a few pennies from um, the, the last grant that we had. And I have two interns working with me over the summer. And um, they're both doctoral students. And um, neither one of them is from an adult ed background, but uh, they're pretty well convinced that um, it's, it's definitely worth their while doing. And so we've been working this summer on support systems. So that was one of the recommendations from adults uh, because many of them come from communities that don't value education or they come from families where the family doesn't support them in education or maybe doesn't support them in anything. Um, there, there were some very sad, uh, even angry stories that people had to share. Um, and so because they lack those support systems, one of their recommendations was, could we have elements of support in adult education that that would make the difference for them? Mm -hmm. It could be peer-to-peer -peer support. It could be uh, support groups such as like grief support, things like that. Um, it could even be support with, with issues that they have financially or with their children. Um, so we're working on a paper on support systems this summer. I expect that to be out probably fall or winter. It always depends mm -hmm. on the publication process. It takes time. Um, 
But going back to those 1900 excerpts that I mentioned, we have, you know, so much more that we know of in root causes that we can talk about and, and the solutions that go with it. So um, it's just a matter of I don't have enough hours in my day. <laughs> and, uh, but, but we will continue to, to analyze those data and, and put out reports because, as Marty said, you know, the governments need to know you know, that this has been researched, that there's, you know, they've followed proper scientific procedures, mm -hmm. which we have. And so, you know, we need to take the time to do that. And research does take an incredible amount of time. So we're, we're going to keep chipping away at it um, as time permits. And um, not sure, I don't have a schedule. I don't have a number of reports that ultimately will come out of it. But uh, we'll continue to, to keep spreading the word on it. Well, I think that sounds good. I, it, it, what I have read so far uh, has been very helpful. And, and I think you're right, Marty, um, when you say that we've, and, and Margaret too, you both said we've known these things for a while, but they've all been anecdotal for the most part. And to be able to actually quantify some things and, and to do really solid research um, is certainly innovative in our field. Um, and I think that more and more, I know that more and more donors are asking for that kind of backup information when any organization asks for funding or applies for a grant. So this not only helps value in furthering your research and your projects, but I would think that if um, all of our uh, directors, community-based and adult ed directors, uh, use these materials in uh, their grant applications, it will really strengthen the uh, approaches that they take to ask for funding for various projects because we, we have not had this kind of information before. We, we certainly could all talk about most of these things, but we haven't had it directly from students um, in a scientifically based research approach. And I, I really commend you for, for this, and I think it's, it's a huge step. Uh, for the field of adult education and literacy to have this beginning study, because you're right, uh, there are many more questions. I think as all of us read this, we're probably going to be sending you other questions <laughs> that we have, and um, that might help to uh, uh, spur some other uh, grant applications and from some future research projects. Um, I'm hoping that that will be the case because I think this is something that's important for our field. Thank you so much, um, Marty and Margaret, for being with us Thank today you. and sharing this wonderful project and also the great work that you're doing in, just in general with Value USA. It's, you know, I, I know you talk about when the organization was formally uh, created, but I know you were working really hard probably for at least 10 years before that. So, yes, Marty, you should be very proud of where, where you've come today. So thank you very much, and um, we look forward to more from the CAPE study and more from Value USA. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great, we're done.